2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be picking up in verse 7 and going through the rest of the chapter tonight. Paul's message to the believers at Corinth is on the topic of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul then continues on this same understanding in verse 6 as he talks in reminding them that they have a ministry that has been given to them, given to them by God, the Father. This is the ministry that, that Paul here is expressing to the believers at Corinth. And because this ministry was given to them, that they received, he says, as this process, they've received mercy. The ministry has been given because of God's mercy. Service. That's the idea behind the word ministry here. And so what we see here, because of this glorious new covenant, this, this ministry has a couple of things that come with it. Number one, that he highlights here, just at the start of verse one, is he says, we do not lose heart. It's one of the things that comes with ministry, that everything through what some would consider perhaps maybe discouragement at times and difficulties in ministry, Paul reminds the believers to never quit, to never quit. And perhaps maybe this proposed a thought or idea ultimately from the Lord, but encouraging them that no matter how tough things get, to retreat is not an option. And he says, listen, we have experienced the grace, the mercy of God by the very truth of God because the gospel has been revealed rather than veiled, but revealed. And to those that it is veiled, it's those who are perishing is what he's saying. And the only reason why they're perishing is Paul says it's because of deception. Verse four, he says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe. Now, notice this, that it doesn't mean that the gospel can no longer shine upon them because that is the power of it. You remember when Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, it's the power of God. That is the, the context of it. It's God's power. And you and I, as believers, just like these here in Corinth, Paul is saying, hey, listen, never quit because you might feel weak. You might feel like giving up. You might feel, as we talked last week, quite a bit on discouragement. And I think all of us here have been discouraged at one point, time or another, right? And, and sometimes that discouragement has been a result. Really, when you get down to the bottom of it, it's it's really us. It's how we allow something to affect us. But if we trust in the strength that God has given us and clearly um, probably have a better understanding where certain things have come from or how certain things have materialized, then we can free ourselves from walking through discouragement and understanding that there is a battle. And tonight, for you and me, our eyes have been open to the gospel. If, if your eyes were not open to it, you would not be here. So this is a clear indication that you have, you have been, you know, the veil has been removed and you have experienced and have seen, though we were once blinded, we're no longer blinded no more. And I love what Paul says. He says, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your bond servants, for Jesus' sake. So ultimately, remember what Paul is saying, that in, in all of this, uh, Paul is saying, this is how this ministry is. Ministering in a way as Paul ministered with heart, not losing heart, but really persevering and pressing in and then 
he says here, with forthrightness, not with, not with cunning words, you know, not with deceptive means, that's what he says. And then in verse 3, he says with perception, understanding that, you know, we, we are dealing with unregenerate people. And how they become that way and why they are that way, because whose minds the God of this age has blinded. And then he says, this is what we're to do. In the midst of this age, exalt Christ. And then he goes on to say here, for us to have this confidence in who the Lord is. This, this picture of having this, this confidence is really important. He says, for it is the God, listen to this, who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Well, when did that happen? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, when God spoke, he he spoke, he said, let there be light. And in Genesis 1, we see that ultimately it was, it was God's work. He spoke light. And the Bible says here that he commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, in other words, there is divine confidence. And I love this picture here of, of the creator. He's, he's, in a sense, it's grasping that understanding. Tonight, as I was looking at this in verse 6, I says, you know, Paul is clearly saying, do you understand that the one who created all things has created us for a purpose? And we see here that the very same one who spoke these words. Let there be light. He spoke the words in the context of that this light would shine out of darkness. And he says this same light has also become that which is in our hearts. And what is the purpose of this light? Well, remember in John chapter one, John says that man was dark. Humanity in its in its in its very core is dark. And he's saying this very truth, that in this darkness, light came. But man loved darkness rather than light. And so they rejected the light. John, in, in, in his you know, letter to his readers, was the very fact that Jesus came but was rejected. And so for man to love darkness rather than light goes back to what Paul is saying here in verse 4. Blinded. Blinded. But that doesn't stop the light of the gospel of the glory of God. So if there is darkness, it is God and God alone who can call light to shine out of darkness. And you guys might say tonight, well, we are living in some very dark times. Well, that's okay. The hope that we have is in the same way that God has at the creation of, of all things said, let there be light. And the Bible says, and there was light. And then when he sent forth his son, once again, there was God in his work saying, let there be light. He sent light to the darkness of this earth once again. And he's saying today, he sends out the church to be that light bearer in the same way that the Father spoke creation into existence and spoke forth his Son to come to this earth. And then the fruit of all of this is what we have today. It is the light of the gospel of Christ. So look at what he says here. He says the purpose of this light shining in our hearts is to what? It says here to give. Underline that in your Bible. It's to give. So, so all of us here can testify tonight that we have had the light of the gospel shine in our hearts. We have been made aware. We know tonight. It's always good to remember why we do what we do. And this kind of challenges our heart to, to do what God's called us to 
Um, you know, as we consider all of this, what, what Paul is ultimately saying here is he's saying, hey, you know, who God is. God is w- who the scriptures say he is. He is creator. He is the one who clearly does this work in us. Now, there's a passage here that I want to get into as we kind of work our way through the next statement that, that, that Paul is going to make. So how does God do that? How does God put his word in us? And, and he's kind of given in this, this imagery. Because remember what he's saying is don't give up. Don't lose heart. There is a purpose and a meaning for why we continue on and do what we do. Where does the power come from? And what is this message? Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about earthen vessels, jars of clay. And in the same way, when we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, that God spoke and said, you know, let there be light. We also see in the book of Genesis that the Lord said here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. So God, listen to this, created man In his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice that. So God created man, right? So think about this for a moment. So Paul is saying, Listen, the same one who created this light in darkness has done this same work in your heart. He, he is our creator. And this very light of the gospel, this treasure, well, he says it in verse 11 of, chap- of this same chapter. What is the treasure? It says, for we who live are always delivered to death, listen to this, for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. What is the treasure? The life of Jesus being made manifest in our mortal flesh. That is this treasure in earthen vessels. This this whole picture here is that, that God does this work. So think about this. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says that, that we are made from, from the dust of the ground. You know, some years ago, we had a, a gentleman that, you know, kind of had this teaching around, um, you know, like clay pots. And he'd come and kind of do this whole demonstration. It's a little bit different than some of the other ones that people are normally used to seeing. I mean, this guy had a great, like, ministry with it. His name was um, John Thomas. And he, he just had a way of really articulating, you know, the potter and the clay. He just kind of laid this whole thing out. But one of the things that he says is he says, you know, these elements that you find within clay are the same elements that you find in the human body. And he began to talk very closely associating how, you know, the dust of the ground, the clay of the earth, the dirt of the earth, whatever, that how we were created in that way. And he talks about this, this imagery of I am the potter, you are the clay. And this is the idea here that Paul had. Ultimately, what Paul is saying is that, you know, the power comes from the Lord. It comes from God. And, and Paul's ministry demonstrated the power of God. That's why Paul is saying, you know, listen, we didn't come to you with persuasive words. You've seen the work of God. You've seen the power of God. You've seen it on display. And when we see this whole picture that this in Isaiah or Jeremiah, excuse me, chapter 
uh, 18 as it talks about the prophet Jeremiah's, you know, message to the people that, that ultimately God's in control. And why does God demonstrate this? To show that ultimately we were created for a purpose. This, this picture here, Paul, at the end of this chapter in verse 18, says we are looking to eternal things. We're not limited to the things that we see. Now, listen, we might benefit from the things that we see momentarily, but ultimately our intended purpose and aim is eternity. That's the image and the picture here. But notice in Jeremiah chapter 18, in verses 2 through 6, let me just kind of consider there one of the symbols of the potter and the clay and, and this detailed example is found here. It says, so I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the will. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter. So are you in my hand, Israel. You see, when you look at this, the point is that the Lord was saying that the people of Israel had went beyond that. They had no desire for the Lord to do this work in them. In other words, they weren't allowing God to be the potter in their life. They were dismissing that ultimately their purpose was not to demonstrate the glory of God. In the same way, we see that, that Paul is saying this very treasure, well, these earthen vessels, this is you and me, jars of clay, that's what we are. And God allows us, yes, our freedom. He allows us to make moral choices. And, and we see that, that he demonstrates often that he's, he's still sovereign and in control, even though we choose to do things that we do, but he's still in control of the universe. There's never been a point in time when God has not been in control. He's ultimately in control of all things. And he does whatever he wills with his creation. Now, remember what the psalmist says in Psalm 135, and I'm reading from the ESV. It says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the sea and all the deeps. Whatever he pleases to do. In Psalm 150, he kind of goes on in this encouragement here um, as, as it's speaking in regards to who the Lord is. To praise the Lord in the mighty heavens and praise him for his mighty deeds. And verse 2 of Psalm 150 goes on to say, praise him according to his excellent greatness. That reminder of praising God. Why? Because he is overall. He's sovereign. The, the entirety of that chapter reveals and reminds us of that. Remember what Daniel said in chapter 4 and verse 35. It says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So we see this reminder that God is over all and can do as he pleases whether we understand his actions or not. And Paul is saying, do you understand that you are jars of clay and his prized possession he has put in you? Why? Because he's sovereign over all. He owes us nothing. Listen to this. He owes us nothing, yet he chooses to extend to us not only this treasure, but the utmost patience and kindness and compassion. And, and, you know, if Jeremiah's message would have been listened to before, they would have heard this prior to this sermon that he gave them. In chapter 9 of Jeremiah, in verse 24, it says, But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The Lord says he delights in these things. The goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. Psalm 36 and verse 
10 says, Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you. There's something about knowing the Lord, right? Where, where, where Paul is saying here in chapter 4, in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he's saying those who have been blinded by the God of this age are at a disadvantage. There's something that we see throughout these verses time and time again, understanding that, that the Lord clearly delights in his work that he does in us. And that, in a sense, you could say that, that even though we know that we are created of dust, that we are clay pots, I mean, this is what, remember what Job said in chapter 10 and verse 9, he's just like, hey, this is just what we are before God. The Bible says in Psalm 103 and verse 14 that, that God knows our frame. He knows our frame. And there is that reminder that God gives grace to the humble. Understanding who we are, ultimately, these earthen vessels, these jars of clay, well, it's really the potter working with clay that reminds us that, that it's God who works in us for his good pleasure. His good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. In Isaiah 45, in verse 9, it says, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but pot, uh, potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say to the, the potter has no hands? Of course not. I mean, I mean, who can say this, right? And it's always good for us to understand that when we look at this, God has created us the way he wants us. And maybe that is the reminder that, you know, God wants us to be, desires for us to be, works this way in us so that we can be. In other words, we're not like this, you know, thing where God is, you know, doing a, uh, you know, what they say, trial and error, right? You're not an experiment. You're a work of God. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. The privilege. And this is how we are able to, Paul says, not quit or give up. Understand that God knows our frame. So in a sense, you can say, because he will talk about being persecuted and, and what he's saying here is that for us, though we are cast down, we will not be conquered. So he's reminding them, remember who the Lord is. The Lord your God is your creator. And it's our responsibility, yours and mine, to take what he's given us and to use it for his glory. That's, that's really the picture of, of what of what Paul is saying here. And to use it for his glory and pleasure. And in doing this, we find, all of us here, find our ultimate fulfillment. What, what is your ultimate fulfillment? I mean, really think about this here. What Paul is expressing here in chapter four is his ultimate fulfillment comes from doing what God created him to do. Like he is the creator of all things, he has created for us here, as Paul speaking to them, he's created for us, the Corinthian church, to be bearers of the light of Christ's gospel, and not to deviate from this, regardless of what others are saying. Paul says, listen, they are not the originators. They are not the creators. God is. What we have is from the Lord, not from the traditions of men, not from persuasive words or deceitfully or manifestations. Listen to this, of these types of things. No, he's saying, this has nothing to do with hidden things of shame. We're not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestations in truth, he says, listen, this is this is a God thing that's happening. And in a sense, you could see that the encouragement ultimately to them is that the opposition that they are facing is 
listen to this, opposition against God, who is the creator, the sovereign God. I mean, you could imagine Jeremiah's message in that day as they listen. They're like, you know, so what are you saying? <laughs> Ultimately, what, what was he saying? He was saying, you've gotten to a place, and I think all of us have been there, where we, where we, we know God's at work, but we, we try to put that work off for a little bit. Because at times we know what that entails. It entails us dying more to ourselves. It entails us to, you know, having to face some realities, right? But ultimately at the end, we might be shamed, but God is not. It's all for his glory. So we are shamed so that he is glorified. And, and this whole picture here is really what he's saying, the privilege of all of this. So our responsibility, right? So this is so that we would rather not live in perhaps disappointment or dissatisfaction. But, but notice what we can do with what God has given us. We can thank him every day for, for everything he's given us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body. And look at what Paul says, and be thankful. And be thankful. Just as the clay, just as the jars of clay, just as the earthen vessels, take, take note of this, guys, finds its highest priority. Listen to this. When we're reminded that we are to remain pliable. We are to remain pliable in the hands of the potter, the one who's in control, the one who Paul says in verse 6, he commanded light to shine out of darkness. A and that light has now lit up in our hearts. So our lives can fulfill their, their highest purpose when we let the potter have his way with us. See, Jeremiah's message to, to the people were, let the Lord have his way with you. But they resisted. And, and so this whole picture here, that we have this treasure in jars of clay, to what? It's to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. These... These jars of clay were, were created by skilled potters. As he's given them this imagery, they know exactly what he's talking about. Not just anybody can make a, a, a jar of clay. And this is why Jeremiah's methods, message is so uh, profound in this, that, that we were created by God. And whatever purpose they were made for, they were made for carrying things. You know, when we go to Israel, as Brother Rick was mentioning, when he went to Israel, you know, um, there's an area we go to, a place called Qumran. And um, if some of you have ever kind of considered reading, like, where we got the, the scriptures, you're going to come across, you know, them finding these scrolls in Cave 4 at Qumran. And, and how these were found, it was very simple. It wasn't that they were looking and going and saying, we must find these scrolls. No, there was just a, you know, a shepherd. It's, it's the common story that the tour guides will tell you is a shepherd kind of having his sheep there and, uh, you know, was kind of working his way through that mountain range there. And, and there was a cave and, and he says the common thing to do is get a rock and just kind of throw it in the cave. If there's anything in there, it'll, you know, come running out or scare something or whatever the case might be. Or there could be water in there, throw it in there. You can hear whatever the case might be. So the shepherd does that. And in doing it, he heard, he heard this thing break. And so ultimately he went in there to further investigate because he heard, you know, a clay pot break. So let me go see what's in there. And he went in there and he found what is known today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is what we use to validate what we have in Scripture. And they were found in these earthen vessels, so to speak, these jars of clay. 
And when you go to Qumran, they have them on display, the type that they were found in, and even some of the remnants of what was found, other pots that were found in there. But these ones had the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, you know, today when you go or you see it, you know, there's like, you know, just different books. If you were to look up the Dead Sea Scrolls, you're going to see a picture of a cave. That's not cave four. And even when you go to Israel today and they take you to Qumran, that's still not cave four. The actual cave is actually on a side road around that mountain within that cleft there. But that is the area. So this is how they would preserve these things. Think about it. The word of God was in the jar of clay. And the same thing God does with us. He does this with you and he does this with me. And think about this for a moment. When we look at this, we see that these were not, you know, like it was broken, right? The, the shepherd, as the story goes, actually broke the jar with a rock, right? So that would imply that though that jar of clay was made to protect the word, preserve the word, right? It was not made to do it forever. Jars of clay served their purpose and they were temporary holding places. And so, but they did their work. You and I are temporary holding places. This is why the picture is so fitting. And so we're like these jars of clay and inside Think about this. Uh, our physical bodies are like those jars. And we are made from clay. In the same way. And our bodies come in all shapes and sizes. Can I get a witness? <laughs> but each designed by our Heavenly Father. You know, so when somebody says, you know, why, 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 are, you, why are you big there, or little there, or tall there, or short there? Here, you know, here's my answer. Just tell him it's the way God made me. But all of it was for whatever purpose the potter desired. So when a potter would make pots, he would make all different shapes and sizes for different purposes. And that's what God does for us. We all have different callings and different ministries and different uses, ultimately for the same purpose. And... This is what the Lord does. So even though our body is a temporary housing for this, for this, there is like how Paul is saying here, there's an intended aim, there's an intended purpose. You know, I often ask myself this question, what if this all just ends tonight? Anybody know what I mean by that? What if this all just ends tonight? What if the rapture of the church happens or, you know, I don't know, maybe some other thing takes place, but your life, my life, and we're standing before the Lord. You know, in a sense, we know for those whose lives are in Christ, you know, and, you know, people have all these different, you know, views of, you know, if you're doing this much, then you're in. If you're not doing this much, you know, listen, it's not by what we do. It's by what Christ has done. But, but here's the point we all are going to hear those words, well done. That means that our jar of clay is no longer useful for its purpose that it was created for for here. So, you know, when we are going and we're doing these, you know, funeral services, boy, did I do over 30 some funerals last year. And I would say on several occasions, if I knew the people really well and it was a Christian, you know, service to glorify the Lord, I always say, this is just the shell. This loved one that you've, that you've grown to know for all these years, that's just the shell. It's, it's the jar of clay. And what's with the Lord is who God knew. You knew the shell. God knew the real person. God knew the soul. And they're with the Lord. And they're in eternity. And they're worshiping Him. And one day this shell is going to be reunited with, with this soul because that's what 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is all about. But this corruption, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, will take on incorruption. This mortal will take on immortality and that resurrection. And it's all going back to that very thing. One day, these jars of clay, as we just read in, you know, Jeremiah, he says, hey, listen, 
Should you not be pliable? Should you not be? Israel was like, no, well, the day's going to come when we will be because this mortal's going to take on immortality. And we should always be, whether it's for the work of the ministry or for, listen to this, our glorification. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work. So ultimately, these jars of clay are created for earth's purpose. And think about this. So in verse 4, <clears throat> this whole thing of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, this is this very thing, that we are housing places for this treasure that God has given us. And that's it right there, the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. And the knowledge of the gospel is a rich truth that is still to this day transforming life. So God's entrusted us with that. And, and if he does, this treasure that we proclaim is an enduring treasure. It's not something that fades away. It's something that continues to, to do what needs to be done. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, we're living life right now, aren't we? We're alive. We're breathing, right? Uh, we have a routine that we are facing. Maybe tomorrow you get up, you're going to go to work, you're going to do whatever you're going to do, finish the rest of your week, whatever your week looks like. So there is a life that we're living. Well, listen to this. Paul here is saying, don't give up. You still got to live life and live it to the fullest for the glory of God, not for the purpose of selfish ambitions or endeavors. But he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness the knowledge of him who's called us to his own glory and excellence. So we can be encouraged and reminded, just like he was saying here in verse 6, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, and, and this has now become this light that has now shined in our hearts. We, we, we've experienced this. And so it's a privilege I don't know how some of you see it, but truly it is a privilege to hold this knowledge of our creator through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a privilege for you and me to, to be able to do this. This is, remember what Jesus is saying in John chapter 14 and verse 26, because, you know, Peter's saying, hey, he's given you all that you need. Jesus says in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You and I were destined to perdition. We were dead in our sins and destined for destruction, right? But, but God made a way for us to, to, to have a new life, and this is that work that he did. So our physical body, these, these jars of clay, he's... He's made new. We're no longer who we used to be. That, that passage that we always quote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. So this is an awesome thing because God also in, extends an invitation for whosoever will, whosoever desires to come. Even in these earthly bodies, he's saying, come. And in this relationship with the Lord, he then gives us the greatest treasure any earthly vessel can hold. And he's saying here, very clearly here, that the Lord has given us this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency, or the excellence, excuse me, of the power of, may be of God and not of us. So God's plan and I think this is noteworthy, God's plan is to put extraordinary, heavenly treasures into 
ordinary earthen vessels. For what purpose? So that the attention will go to the content rather than the container. That's the picture of it right there. So that the glory can go to the content rather than the container. See, it's not the jar of clay. It is this treasure within this jar of clay. And so when we are born anew in Christ, spiritually, every single one of us, we will obtain, of course, still in this body of flesh, but but we now can be this jar of clay that the Lord is saying, here, go now and take this message. Still living in, in the framework of ordinary human lives, but for the glory of God. So what does this look like as we live this out? Now we know we got this, but we say, yeah, this is exciting. We have it, but boy, there's a lot that comes with this. Well, here's something to consider. So remember what the Lord said in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. He said concerning Paul, he said Paul was his chosen vessel. He's talking about this here, this, this earthen vessel. He says, Paul is my earth, a chosen earthen vessel. So his structure, his structure, his frame, who he is, is in the hands of the Lord. Psalm 139 in verses we see here, uh, you know, verses 13 through 16. But prepared for good works. It, this is the whole thing about it. Remember in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it, this whole message was, you know, vessels of honor rather than vessels of what? Dishonor. And so the whole purpose of it is that, listen, okay, so we might say it's tough. Is this a great responsibility? I would say no. Paul says we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are hard pressed on every side, but yet not crushed. Why? Why, why is there a need to be hard pressed, but not crushed? In other words, we are squeezed, but we're not squashed. Think about that. That's the best way to give the example here. As a matter of fact, there have been some that have said this is very hard to explain these words. But, but this is what, what he's kind of saying here. We're, we're sometimes, in a sense, he says here, we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. In other words, we are bewildered in our walk, but we are not befuddled. That's another good picture. So in other words, we are to stay the course. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, this was Paul's encouragement to his young protege. He says, fulfill your ministry, fulfill it. In other words, stay the course. Look at what else he says, persecuted, but not forsaken. What does that mean? Pursued, but not abandoned. Think about that for a moment. Pursued, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. How about that? Knocked down, but not knocked out. This whole picture here that I think is important for us to, to consider and take in, because here's what he's saying, is that these things take place. Some days, listen to this, you are going to be squeezed, but you're not going to be squashed. <laughs> you'll... you'll you will feel like your eyes are about to pop out of your head, but they're not, okay? L listen, you're going to feel hard-pressed, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Look at verse 10. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Think about this. So in other words, he's saying weakness is centered, is centered, is, is, is in a sense with power. How? It, it reminds us when Paul says, when I am weak, he is. So his strength is perfected in my weakness. Always 
caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested. So in other words, God's power, Jesus' death and resurrection, did you know it's manifested in our bodies? You know, this is why at times, you know, we, we have to be merciful when we do see some crush under the pressure of being hard-pressed. You know, we, we have to show mercy. We have to show, you know, a process of restoration and bringing people back into the fold. That's always been one of the staples of, of our ministry. You know, we, we might not be like, like, like other churches, and that's okay. I'm not trying to. But I, I want to do what God's called us to do. And I'll never, ever, ever forget a story I heard years ago. And it was, it was you know, spoken in regards to, you know, at times... We live in this, in this body of flesh and we are hit from every side. Whether it's persecution because the church is going through a time of that or great spiritual warfare or we're just battling the day-to-day -day adversities in life. You know that it's all a battle. And at some point and in some way, you and I will experience on a day-to-day -day the battle that is spiritual and that is so great. But Paul is saying here, be encouraged because in this very body that you will experience this with. Now, remember, Jesus perfected that in his body. The Bible says, you know, we have a high priest who could sympathize with our weaknesses, who was tempted in all points, but did not sin. Now, you and I are tempted and we sin. Right. We don't always knock it out the park. We fall short then what we do is we appeal to the graces and the mercies of God. And then we say, okay, God, forgive me. And, you know, these processes are important. I believe that, that with this, this is the hope that we give the world. Remember, in chapter 2, just a couple of chapters before, what was, what was Paul's word to the ones that listened to him to deal with the man in sin in the church? In 1 Corinthians 5, he says, you got to kick this guy out. Not because there to get joy in kicking him out. No, the whole point was he's saying, listen, if you allow this to continue, this little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. And from the picture here, they were deceived. Paul says, where, where did you think that this was okay? But remember, there was opposition. There was already other stuff being spoken into their ear. And they thought they were doing something good. They were saying, well, you know, we're just we're just going to love on him. Paul says, you're you're puffed up with your with your love. You're, you're doing more damage to him than anything. Yes. What Paul was saying was address the issue. If he chooses not to forsake it, because that clearly was the case there. They were allowing him in the corporate worship. They were allowing him. So in other words, Paul didn't say, hey, listen, when you remove him from the church, you're removing him from Christianity. That's not what Paul was talking about. Paul was saying to remove him from the in other words, it's like this. Remove him from, you know, the position that he's holding because to be in this particular thing and at the moment he wasn't going to let go. He had been living this way for a period of time. And so he had no desire to stop doing what he was doing. He was he was, you know, with his with his mom. And so it wasn't like they had a com if they would have had a conversation with him right there and he would have turned from it and repented, then we would have seen the story. But. The fact that they had to remove him is because he had no desire. And so then they put him out and he no longer had the fellowship, the privileges. Of, and Paul says this type of sin is not even mentioned among the non-believers. The Gentiles will kill you if you commit this sin. And here we're letting him do this and 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 be up here and doing all this. And this is not this is not how it works. Now, if he desires to, it's like that Proverbs 28, 13. Who, who, he who conceals the matter will not prosper, but he who forsakes it finds favor with the Lord. And, and, and what they did was, and Paul then said, put him out. And then we see in his second letter here in chapter two, he says this, now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. Verse 10, he says, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. That one is, is the man that he's, he's talking about.
And he's saying, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he's telling them here, listen, this, this individual, you know, and he just encouraged them a couple of verses before. He says, go and, and comfort this one. Look at in verse 7, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you were obedient in all things. So you see, Paul said, you now seen the benefit of it. And I also was doing something else. I wanted to see if you would obey. Who were you going to listen to? Were you going to listen to me as I sent you this letter? Or were you going to continue on with doing what you were doing? Ultimately, what did Paul say? Paul says, listen, bring him now back into the fold, lest he become discouraged or swallowed up with too much sorrow. And you know, sometimes that's what happens when a person is maybe they're being crushed or pressed or, you know, all these things that Paul is describing here. It, it might be that. It might be somebody really going through severe trial in their life. Now, listen to this. The best thing to do is work with them. The story that I was, you know, referring to was, you know, a pastor who had you know, uh, had been in a very, you know, compromised situation. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. It was, it was something that had been continuing on for a while. And it wasn't just this one person. There were other things that had surrounded around it and, and other people were involved. And I'll never forget that, you know, this whole thing broke loose, that this guy had this, you know, this relationship, this affair. Nobody knew the details because nobody was there except that pastor and that woman. And ultimately, the pastor stepped down from the church that he was pastoring and went and sat at another church because that pastor found out. And he called him and he said, he just remembered this. He says, you know, did you? Re yes, I repented and, and I want to be restored. So he says, okay, you come over here and I'm going to restore you. You know how many churches and pastors came against this pastor for taking the time to restore this man? He says, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're just as bad as him. And you're just in as much sin as he is in. But isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? And, and then they brought him in, you know, and then about maybe six months to a year later, he's now back teaching a Bible study at that church. And the people weren't happy with that. And you know that he's lived in the shadows of that one act. And that man has blessed many with his Bible teachings throughout the years. And that man's name is David Hawking. And the pastor that restored him was Pastor Chuck Smith. And I remember one thing as people criticize Chuck, and this is why I don't care for people's criticism. I care about the word of God. And that is this. Chuck says, if I err, I'm going to err on the side of grace. That's what we need to be doing. Rather than looking, listen, Paul says we are crushed. We are persecuted. Listen to this. We are, we are hard pressed. That happens enough. We don't need to be doing this to one another. We are all created in the image of God. And he puts that message, that, that earthen vessel, you know, that, that treasure in earthen vessels. That's you. We're all working towards the same thing. And ultimately here Paul's is saying, listen, these things happen. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. How is the life of Jesus manifested in our mortal flesh? One, it's what? A testimony, right? You see it. This is what they once were. This is what they are. No, that's powerful, right? But what about when a person goes through severe trial in their life? You know, Peter says that severe trial in the life of the Christian, he says it in chapter 4, you know, 1 Peter chapter 4, at the very start of all of it, he says, this, it serves its purpose. He goes on to say in the rest of chapter 4 that, that these severe trial in the life of the Christian serves for a purpose of refining. And so there are some things we're going to go through. There are some things we're going to experience. Restoration is key. That's only if the person wants to be restored. It's evident here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that this individual that was cast outside of those things was restored because his desire was to be restored. It worked. Remember what he said, 
He says, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of what? He didn't say for him, for the destruction of his flesh. Ultimately, he's going to get, if he truly was, if he truly was a believer, like you guys were priding yourselves on, no, he is really one of us. We're just giving him time. Paul says, and if he really is one of you, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. He will eventually realize the sin that he's in, and he's going to come back. And isn't that what happened? Because every child of God comes back. He does. Because he's experienced the goodness of and we're all in that same boat, right? We, we, we've all been that. So in a sense, it's one way. Yes, persecution from, you know, the enemy, Satan, at us. Um, you know, yesterday I was, I was eavesdropping in the women's study and I was listening to the sister that was teaching. And she says, you know, we have these, we have these three enemies that we face. You know, and it is, you know, the world, obviously, because are we not tempted by the world? Anybody here ever been tempted by the world? At least one time in your Christian walk, okay. And the world is, it is our enemy. It's an enemy to God. And then we also have Satan, who is God's enemy, right? And we know that that battle has been going on since before we were even around. But it is a battle that's raging, right? It's, it's constantly going. And the world is the battle that we see every day, that the church is living in the midst of this fallen world. But then we also have the flesh, and that's the personal battle that when we open our eyes, we're immediately in the second we open our eyes in the morning and we start breathing. It's like boots on the ground, it is on. And this is why this reminder here is, listen, whether you are feeling this from, you know, being persecuted as a Christian, and, and I would say that temptation from the world and the flesh is also persecution to the church. You're the church, I'm the church. And it's going to be the means by which Satan will try to disrupt God's work. But he's saying, hey, listen, when all these things take place, know this. That when these things do happen, it's for the purpose of what? The life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. I, I love that. So Paul's weakness, listen to this, made room for the power of God. How many are weak tonight? Okay, so you're in the company of many weak people. Our weakness makes room for God's power. And isn't that what this all is? So look at that. Now, so then, death is working in us, but life in you. I love that. He, he says, you know, yeah, our lives have been put on the line. But who's benefited from this? Paul says, you guys have. He says, death is working in us. But you now have a relationship with the Lord God. So, so Christ himself is the treasure. And so this whole picture here that we see um, clearly demonstrates a couple of things. That God himself the call of God is that Christ would come and dwell and be extra expressed through these earthen vessels, you and me. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, he says, I believe and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. And Notice that Paul here is quoting um, from David's writing. He, he's quoting from the sweet psalmist of Israel. In Psalm 116, in verse 10, what is he saying here? Well, what Paul is saying, in one sense, we're delivered by God. David is saying in the same context that he was delivered by God. Both delivered by God. In other words, he's saying, I have a, a kindred heart to David. Talk about David's life. Paul was, <laughs> that's two types of uh, trial in their life, right? David brought a lot of it on himself, did he not? But we see God's grace in the midst of that. Because what did David do? Did he quit? No, he didn't. And the enemy, if for, for any of us, that if we would have committed any of the sins that David committed, we would have quit. 
That's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to think that God can't forgive that, but he can. He's, he's God. He's the one that does it, right? Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So God clearly is reminding us through his word here that we can rest assured that in the same way that Christ was raised, you and I can be raised. I'm thankful that the Lord raises us up regularly. He raises us up regularly. For all things are for your, listen to this, or excuse me. He says here, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sake that the grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. So this implies growth, this abundant grace that we see in the original King James, it says abundant grace. So God has called us to invest and to increase the treasure, not just guard it. Invest in it, increase in it. And he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. There it is once again. We do not lose heart. We do not give up. This ministry that God gave, listen to this. God, the triumphant son, is what he talks about in chapter 2 and verse 14, right? Through the glorious spirit in chapter 3 and verse 18. By the power of God the Father here that he just implies in chapter 4 and verse 7. See, Paul understood this. This was the very thing that, that encouraged Paul. It, it put Paul in this ease and understanding this is what it's all about. So this encouraged Paul in everything that he did. He says here, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Look at that. The outward man is perishing, Paul's life was ministry beaten, okay? But he says, listen, and he wasn't an old man. He, he wasn't an old man. He's just saying that, that this outward man, it, it is perishing. But are we living for the outward man? No, we're living for eternal things, and that's why he says the inward is being renewed day by day. For our light, look at what he calls it, our light affliction. Wow. In other words, he's saying these, these trials, this whole thing, listen to this, it's light to carry, which is but for, listen to this, a moment. For the purpose of what? To, to transform us and to renew us. It's a process. This is what Peter was saying in 1 Peter 4, guys. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So what is in view here? Eternity. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The heavenly destiny was in view. And he's like, heaven's in view. Listen, tonight you might be hard-pressed on every side, yet you're not crushed. You might be perplexed, but you're not in despair. You might be persecuted, but guess what? You will not be forsaken. Struck down, but you will not be destroyed. Because he is the potter, you are the clay. And he put his treasure in earthen vessels so that the life of Jesus will be made manifested in our, I love how he puts it, mortal flesh. Not immortal, mortal flesh. What does that mean? God knows your frame. He understands who you are. He created you. So trust that it's by his grace and his power that we can do what he's called us to do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight that your word is true.